synchronizing your data management with the cloud. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, myself as well as our keynote speaker. My name is Deborah Langer. I am Vice President of Sales for Data Source Consulting, now part of eXcel, and we manage the uh, enterprise data management arm of eXcel's business. So very excited to have you all here today, and we hope that you get a lot out of today's educational series. Uh, really looking forward to this presentation. It's cloud. It's such a hot topic. Um, it's certainly an area of importance given some of the value that you can achieve from moving to the cloud. And Eric Linneman, our guest speaker today, who is the director of the cloud competency here at DataSource, is going to be your speaker today. Eric has over 20 years of enterprise consulting. And his pedigree involves working with a multitude of cloud platforms, including Azure, AWS, and Odoo. He has multiple uh, awards that he has received for customer engagement, performance, leadership, as well as at the C-level, engagement level. Uh, he is, no question, an expert in cloud migration, as well as hybrid cloud, and also a term that we don't hear so often, cloud to cloud. So with that, I'd like to get started with the presentation and pass the baton over to Eric. Thank you, Deborah. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. So we're going to talk about the cloud and how to modernize your data successfully, how to plan and, uh, and develop a cloud migration plan, moving both data, workload, compute, and uh, the BI stack over. So we're going to, the, the structure here is we're going to talk a little bit about what the analysts say kind of give an overview of what the different cloud services are and how they uh, align with your business needs. Talk about the different types of cloud computing and the different models that are being used, and then really dive into the economics of moving to the cloud. So the cloud is really, it's been called the fourth wave of computing. And I think we're all familiar with it in one way or another. If you're a Netflix user, you're using the cloud. If you're uh, doing online banking, you're using the cloud. So the cloud really is a new model of compute for both enterprise, business to business, and consumer, uh, business to consumer models, where you're using resources that are leased or purchased in a uh, different um, deployment model. And uh, there's a company called 451 Research that has uh, published a paper where they're saying that by 2019, 60% of all enterprise workloads will be cloud enabled or, or ready for the cloud. So it's a, it's a major migration that's going on, major transformation for IT both in-house and then also for the leadership side of IT and where things are going. As we've moved from a, uh, a labor-based economy and manufacturing-based economy to a service-based economy, IT is now transforming also to a service-based IT. In this diagram here, we, we get a good feel for the different types of cloud models, platform, infrastructure, and soft, software as a service, and the various services that are being deployed in the cloud. And you can see they span everything from basic compute and runtime environments, all the way to storage, reporting, messaging, Internet of Things, and uh, queuing. And the cloud really is taking over and it's the major source of growth in the IT industry nowadays. But this gives you a good overview of what a service-based model of IT looks like. So there are really three main platforms, main types of cloud computing. There's infrastructure as a service where you're, you're purchasing infrastructure that you uh, lease in quantity. And usually these are um, things that are Microsoft Azure, AWS EC2, you're buying these for things like uh, migrating current workloads with license up to the cloud, uh, having cloud-based backup, additional scalability and things of that nature. The other main one that we see is platform as a service. So you're buying a software package. Typically, uh, the, everything is bundled and configured. You're buying access to it. And it's a place where you can develop new code, new capabilities. The examples there are um, Amazon's Elastic Beanstalk. So these provide scalability at a uh, marginal cost. And then the third model that's often seen is software as a service. So if your company is working with Salesforce.com or you're using Office 365, those are examples of software as a service. It's a completely packaged model where you're buying access and you don't have to pay for things like management, uh, um, storage, 
examples like that. These can be broken down into a, a diagram here. If you look at moving left from right uh, on-premise, the, the items that you have to manage on your own are on-premise. Everything from applications, supporting the, the product, your middleware, the OS, the servers, the infrastructure, networking. As you're purchasing uh, infrastructure as a service, you're buying the services that come along and managed by the company, and in this case, it's Microsoft, where they handle the virtualization, the virtual servers, storage, and networking. But you're deploying your own software, your own middleware configuration, and migrating your own data. Platform as a service is, a, is another model where you're really moving your application and your data into the environment, and everything else is managed by your cloud vendor. And then finally, the software is a service where everything is managed by the, the vendor. You're buying access and capability rather than having to buy uh, individual components. So there are three modes of cloud deployment that we see. There's a, a public cloud, which is the most common, hybrid cloud, which we're seeing quite a bit of at this point. And we'll go into detail on these, and then private cloud. In public cloud, this is where your uh, Amazon AWS or Microsoft Azure comes into play. So the services are completely managed by the, the hosting vendor, and they're available on the networks, publicly available. And you're, you're paying for the infrastructure and the availability. These are generally sold on a uh, SLA basis, so your contract defines generally like a 99.5% availability, and you can configure this for high availability, failover, uh, multi-zone, things of that nature. Examples in this place, uh, in this model, are Azure, AWS, Salesforce, and uh, one of the vendors that we work with quite a bit, Snowflake Computing, which provides a uh, data warehouse in the cloud. So that's the uh, public cloud model that most people are familiar with. Private cloud is something that a number of our customers have deployed, where they're building out a cloud-based secure infrastructure on-premise. So it uses the same deployment model as a public cloud, but everything is kept behind the firewall. And, you, and it's all governed by internal IT. This is often used for very secure workloads or issues where we have uh, requirements to have very tight control on things. And the, the, the nature of having a private cloud and everything behind the uh, firewall provides an additional layer of security. Now, keep in mind, with a private cloud, you're also managing all those elements that would normally be managed by a vendor in a public cloud. And then hybrid cloud. So we're seeing quite a bit of this. Uh, customers are using this to do a partial migration to the cloud or move separate workloads. And this is where we're connecting both on-premise workloads or on-premise data to capabilities up in the cloud, like moving a BI stack into the cloud or connecting an uh, uh, external application like Salesforce. And this is uh, often used today for people to do transitional efforts to move to the cloud or scale up capability for seasonal adjustments. Uh, retail is, is a big user of this kind of thing. And it's, it's designed to provide the method of, of getting to the cloud. You can have secure access, remain local, and public access to data in a cloud-based environment. So let's talk about the economics of the cloud. So Gartner published a paper a couple of years ago that became pretty famous where they talk about roughly two-thirds of all IT spending is, is uh, done just to keep the lights on, not to make transformation or grow the business. And this is a problem. If IT becomes 70% uh, or so just keeping the lights on, the value to the business of the IT world is, is low. And really 20% is what is spent for growing the business or adding innovation and new capability. And that's the traditional IT model. And we've got to break that cycle. But remember this 20% uh, model because it's going to come up later in our discussion. So the cloud changes a few things. Um, if we look at our traditional models, it's usually uh, capital expenditures, CapEx. And these are generally large lump sum purchases. So you're financing a number of servers or infrastructure, hardware, uh, switches and networking, storage, 
sand arrays, things of that nature. They're often large purchases, sometimes financed through a vendor, but they're set with a uh, uh, usually a maintenance contract over a period of years that increases over time. And that's a that's a problem for the business because your costs are increasing while the asset is depreciating. It's not a model that's sustainable. Um, when when you operate in this manner, it's also very difficult to um, compute the value of the infrastructure and the value of, of what you've invested versus the business value that comes to mind. So in the cloud, that changes. And we move to operational expenses, OPEX. And these are, this is a, um, a different economic model. You pay as you go. And with the cloud, it's really a terminate at will. So you're not signing any long-term contracts. Although there are multi-year contracts that we'll talk about later to leverage to drive costs down. But it's usually is cheaper, not always, not guaranteed. And it's usually easier to align CapEx with a business cycle, I mean OpEx with a business cycle than CapEx. The costs are very transparent. You bill on a monthly basis and you can align those directly to the business value for what you're getting from an IT perspective. So let's give an example. We have a customer that uh, we recently um, put together a model moving forward and moving from a legacy environment where they had a number of uh, items that were on depreciating hardware, something that the, the CTO told us keeps them up at night. It's in an environment where they're flood prone, um, it's aging hardware, they're really at capacity and they're struggling with that. So our model was to move them to a new environment on AWS and leverage a product called DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL database. Uh, gives us um, millisecond response, and for some seasonality needs, we can scale that up and add in an in-memory cache and get microsecond response. But it's uh, it's a NoSQL database, and there's a couple of different models on how we can transform the data in that. And the important thing here to understand is it's serverless. There's no server that they have to configure and manage. They're just buying a service. This is true platform as a service purchase. And it's got native integration with other services that they're looking at on the AWS platform, like a warehouse that they're, they're planning on, and Lambda for searching. So this is the model that we came up with. And here's where the cost transform from their existing hardware, which is costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. In this case, um, roughly 5 million writes per day. So these are log files that are coming in from servers, 5 million reads, roughly uh, a 1K um, data writes and reads. And the Dynamo is priced in, in a utility model, so you pay as you use. In this case, we, we, we configured it with uh, what are called 58, well, write capacity units, WCUs, 58 to handle the workload that we had, and uh, 29, half as many uh, read capacity units. But the net cost on this new environment is under $32 a month. So. The economics of the cloud are changing things. Instead of having this aging hardware with uh, expensive licensing, they now can scale this um, at less than $50 a month. The meeting to make the decision probably paid for the entire year of, of the cloud service. So you're gonna ask a question, why does cloud make sense for IT? Um, Amazon commissioned uh, data or uh, IDC to do a study about two years ago about the TCO, the total cost on an application, both in an on-prem environment and then using AWS. And the cost is roughly 35% of the on-prem environment to move it to the cloud. You'll notice a couple of things that are on here that really strong. One, uh, staff management is a third of what the costs were before. And IT infrastructure has gone away. So they went from 655,000 in IT fees and infrastructure costs down to 239K in AWS fees. Coming along with that is all the management of the network, security, and things of that nature. So the, the model moving to the cloud makes an economic um, uh, advantage for development efforts and for maintaining uh, current applications. Part of what uh, we face in transforming customers to the cloud is what do I do with all my IT workers? And um, 
those workers have intrinsic value because they understand the business, they understand how things operate. And really, uh, the, the goal is to retool them to be able to transform that 20% uh, model that Gartner talked about of transforming the business into 80% of their efforts. Uh, there's a quote on here from Sadia, who's the CEO of Microsoft. And I was at Microsoft when that transition happened. And Microsoft's in a big um, effort, both a mind share and a uh, skills transition, to move from a traditional IT environment to a cloud-based, mobile-first, cloud-first uh, environment. And again, this is critical. So learning and retraining and developing the skills on those people are very important. The costs are going to shift um, in the cloud transformation, as you saw from the development and some of the costs that we saw on this Dynamo example. And those, the availability of, of funds moves from just keeping the lights on to actually um, training those people to transform the business. In the case of one customer where we're proposing this, their BI staff is moving from simply report writing to transforming into a tool, a true BI stat, self-service, and machine learning. So it's critical that we take the skills that, that the people have, the knowledge that they have of the business itself and how they add value to their customers and transform those to align with the new tools and new methodologies. And mo most people will say, well, you know, the cloud is simple. Um, what you see on the right here, that's the pricing model provided by Amazon on their web page for just one set of products. Now, there's multiple modes of pricing for each one of those. So the, the pricing is very important and it's very complex. Um, one of the things we talked about earlier is the multi-year contracts. You can sign up, if you have predictability, you can sign up for a multi-year contract with any of the web vendors, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Informatic, any of the big web vendors, and lower your costs, in some cases, up to 50%. But in order to do that, you really need to understand the, the needs that the business has, both seasonality and growth patterns, what you're gonna do with your people as far as skills and where new development is gonna happen, and then align all those resources and new, the new compute model with where your business is headed. When you factor in the costs, um, factor in the, the skills retraining and uh, new capabilities that you're going to have um, from these new tools and, and new skills in your people, and then build a, a model that supports sustainability and high availability as needed. So when we put together a cost model, it takes into account all those factors, and then we're looking at the services here on, on the right and which ones, which ones align with the business needs. So the cloud is not simple, but it, but it is coherent and there is a, a, a rational plan um, that you can put together that aligns your cost with what the business value really is. So we're talking about the players in the cloud and uh, really talking about um, two main players that, that we work with quite a bit, and that's Microsoft and Amazon. And Gartner did an analysis last year. They um, classify customers. So us consumers of the cloud into two different groups. Mode one, our traditional IT, and we're looking for cost reduction, um, some safety and security, uh, be able to overcome that issue that the CTO mentioned to us of you know staying up at night worrying about his data center flooding and how does he keep things running. And then mode two, which are really the more agile IT that are looking for new capabilities, trying to experiment, develop new um, opportunities using technology and provide some business agility. So Gardner's modeled the customers into two different factors, and then they give some description of how those customers work with the vendors here. So for Amazon, Amazon aligns closely with the mode two buyers, so the more agile type companies, and the companies that are looking to do very rapid type uh, work. But it's also a, a good choice for mode one uh, customers. And the reason that it aligns for that is the vendors all market and they uh, advertise basically limitless scalability. And with the utility model, you pay as you go and you pay as you need. But one thing that Gartner calls out is transformation efforts are really best taken with a uh, systems integrator, a vendor, such as data source, where we can leverage the experience and the capabilities and, and uh, our knowledge to help optimize your business deployment into the cloud. So 
So Gardner's view of Microsoft and Azure um, is slightly different. So Mode 1 customers, those are the, the folks that have a Microsoft Enterprise Agreement, have a lot of on-prem um, hardware, on-prem licensing. And Microsoft is making that an advantaged uh, model with their pricing model and their, their licensing model to move folks to the cloud. So it's a good opportunity for folks to do a migration off of old depreciating hardware or out of an environment that barely scales to what the business needs. But then the Mode 2 customers are, are looking for Microsoft's ability to integrate for that hybrid type of environment and also the new capabilities that are coming out. And um, the two vendors are fighting tooth and nail, and I think it's an advantage for all of us as customers on their part. But Azure is often a good solution for customers with a deep Microsoft background and existing enterprise licensing. So let's compare the two. Um, both of them offer a large number of services, and these are growing month by month. Uh, they have regions. So the way that uh, the cloud vendors work, they define regions where they have data centers, where your data compute and storage all, all relies. And you can move things between data centers, and you build out high availability within availability zones at low cost. And they, their pricing uh, models are very similar. So Amazon has on-demand where you can buy literally by the day or by the hour. Spot and reserve pricing where if you can have um, better planning and better estimation of what your, your needs are, you can drive costs down. And they also do de dedicated hosts. And I did a project a number of years ago for a very large stock exchange where we were deploying on dedicated hosts. And we had our own isolated networks, our own isolated hardware, and guaranteed SLA. And then the price, again, varies by region and by the type of service you use. So bringing that planning into play and estimating your cost model is very critical. Um, Microsoft has a slightly different model. They have a pay-as-you-go. They also work through partners, a lot of partners, uh, as they have for, for decades. And they leverage their enterprise agreements and software assurance for migrations to the cloud. So you can take your licensing that's on-prem and migrate to that to the cloud without uh, additional licensing costs. Both vendors work on an SLA-based uh, model where if there's outages, you get credits against your contract. Um, but you can see the numbers that they're looking at are 99.95. In some cases, they're, they're offering four or five nines for certain services. So you might ask, why does it make sense for the vendors? Well. AWS revenue, um, and this is a number from Q1, it's grown since then, but 43% customer growth year over year. This is the fastest growing part of Amazon as a business as a whole. On Microsoft, 93% uh, revenue growth. This is the fastest growing part of Microsoft. So the opportunity is there for them to grow their business quite a bit, and that's where their investments are, are going. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there's a quote from Satya. He's transforming Microsoft into a uh, mobile-first, cloud-first company, and that's where their investment, both in product and infrastructure and capability for customers, is going. Amazon, again, continues to grow at a rate that's um, roughly 50% year over year uh, from a net revenue standpoint, and they have plans to, to grow internationally at an even higher rate. So what type of company needs the cloud? Um, this is an example of one of our customers, and they are in the tax business. And you can see this is their Google Analytics of their, their web front end. They, they receive 6% of their revenue for the year on one day. And there's a, a very uh, sharp spike seasonality-wise uh, that aligns with the tax season. Off-season, they're their usage is, drops down to less than 1% of their normal workload. So this kind of seasonality is, is really tailor-made for the cloud. This is the, the exact customer story that uh, aligns with the cloud. And you have to ask yourself, do you want to buy hardware and licensing to support that 99th percentile? Do you want to support all those database licenses, all that storage uh, for 80% of your year, which is fairly flat? So the, the type of company that needs a cloud is really someone who has seasonality. Uh, retail comes to mind. Um, the 
kind of company that wants to scale out at a lower cost or be able to integrate with vendors, partners, and customers in a secure way at a low cost and protect their on-premise uh, data and applications. And for this customer, uh, our solution was to build out a, a data lake on AWS. And you can see there's a number of um, different services in here, but what this provides them with is a scalable, secure, and cost-effective environment that allows them to do the type of uh, customer support they need with the data coming in on a near real-time basis, which they did not have before. And so there's a number of AWS services. We can scale those up as, as needed during the tax year. We can scale those down to, to near zero uh, when the tax year ends. Um, and this is really the ideal solution for them. Now, what you'll notice is not in here is a lot of servers. Most of these services are, uh, are called serverless, so they really reside purely on the infrastructure that, that Amazon provides. We don't have to have sysadmins. We don't have to have uh, network admins. Those people can be retrained to support customers uh, from a business perspective rather than keeping the lights on. So let's look at a couple of, of uh, typical workloads and where the, the cloud aligns. So we've got a customer that's in the sports and entertainment business. They're an offshoot from law enforcement training, and it was a startup, a spinoff, and they had zero budget for new hardware and zero desire to be building up their own data center, their own infrastructure. Uh, they have kiosks that are being deployed all over the country that stream data back in, and they were looking for a BI stack on top of uh, an environment. In this case, AWS was our data warehouse where all our, our databases and our um, uh, star schema and OLAP existed. And then we layered Microsoft Power BI on top of that. Um, it provides real-time access to data, information both for the retailers that are using this and the company leadership itself to be able to see where they're at as far as usage. The nice thing about this, it took about an hour of work and we were able to transform this to work on an Apple Watch when it first came out. So the value to the customer, the value to all of us is tremendous on the cloud because of the rapid um, growth and the rapid capabilities that are coming along. But in this case, we went from, from initial talk and design to full deployment in 90 days. And then another cloud um, workload that we often see is to test drive solutions. So what we've got here is some of the stuff from Amazon. Um, we're looking at implementing Informatica big data management and testing that out. Uh, we can provision from pre-configured images, so we've got all the best practices that the vendor recommends. We don't have to deploy or build anything ourselves. We literally just select it and push a button. And we can have an environment in place in an hour. The cost on this is about an hour per uh, usage, a dollar per hour per usage. And the nice thing about it is we can do a two-week proof of concept, turn it off, and our costs are very minimal. So these are great opportunities for things like bake-offs and looking at features and testing even migrations to new versions. So both, both of the big vendors, uh, Microsoft and Amazon, offer marketplaces where you can um, use these image files. And they use a slightly different term, but you can see there's literally hundreds of different image files broken out into various categories. If you wanna, if you wanna look at Teradata, it's about a two hour cycle to spin up an entire Teradata environment from a pre-configured image. No installs, no configuration other than setting up users and configuring security to have access. And so this is a great opportunity to leverage the cloud at a very low cost, very rapid time frame. And if it's not the solution that you're looking for after you've tested it out, you shut it off and the costs all go away. Another cloud workload, uh, this was a company that was uh, bringing in SEC data on uh, various companies and stock information. It all comes from a public API, so the data was, uh, was sourced from outside of the cloud environment, but brought, brought in through an integration layer. It provided deep analytics capability for this company, which is where they provided value for their customers, and it gave partner and vendor integration without exposing any internal data. So as you can see the little example here, um, they were bringing in stock information from multiple sources 
and SEC type of information, packaging this, and then providing value add to their customers. The total time on turning this um, from initial design to deployment was one month, and it scales to support tens of thousands of customers. Another cloud workload is Internet of Things, and this is a fast-growing area. In fact, we're um, doing some work here in-house and training our people on Internet of Things. So uh, 451 Research has estimated that roughly two-thirds of companies are looking at increasing their, their spending on IoT. And there's some great opportunities here, mobility, retail, and automation. So as the digital transformation begins hitting more manufacturing, more retail um, spaces, the type of streaming data coming in fits perfectly with this type of thing. Uh, IDC estimates that the global spending on Internet of Things in three years is going to hit $1.29 trillion. So the marketplace in this is fantastic. There's a lot of growth going on. The tools are maturing very quickly. And this is where you can grow and in, in, uh, leverage the scale of, of the cloud. Um, if you need more storage, you literally configure it, uh, push, a, push a button, and it's available. If you need more compute, you configure it or you set up for auto scale and you no longer have to manage those type of things. And really the benefit on this is reduction in non-value added activities. So streaming of data, and a good example is a utility company that um, I've done some work with brings in a ton of SCADA information. In the past, they had to have people uh, spending a lot of time uh, going out managing infrastructure with some new capability, new technology in place. All this is being brought in real time into a uh, big data environment. And this is also enabling some new things. There's a story about Tesla. A couple of years ago, they had a, an issue that the um, feds wanted them to issue a recall for. But using the data they were c collecting, they were able to figure out what the issue was because of Internet of Things type of data streaming in and issue a software fix that they could uh, push remotely to all the cars and solve the problem. And it, it actually caused an issue because is that a recall or isn't it? If you're fixing a, a known problem on a car and your customer doesn't have to bring it to the shop, you can do it remotely. Is that still a recall? And this is all uh, because of this capability of the Internet of Things and data coming in from sensors and uh, other you know, sources that are streaming in. So one of the questions that our customers ask quite a bit is, how do I get my information into the cloud? And that brings up another uh, product suite, which is known as iPaaS, so Integration Platform as a Service. And this is the type of tools that you use to migrate data, connect and, and organize and orchestrate the information from on-prem systems to the cloud, or even cloud to cloud, or cloud to external vendor. And it really handles a number of different things, routing and orchestration. It's usually implemented programmatically, so it's supportable and scalable. Um, the different models, and then you can uh, handle the timing and workloads and do full reporting on this, uh, fail, failure recovery, resiliency, things of that nature. The big vendors in this area are Informatica, Talon, SnapLogic, and, and Dell with their Boomi product. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Informatica product, but this is a, a, a tremendous value that our customers are starting to explore in moving to the cloud and doing it quickly. So an iPaaS product has to meet a number of different things. It has to be able to integrate uh, legacy data, some analytic sources, maybe streaming data, maybe vendor or partner data coming in. You need, it, traditionally, um, it's built out with what are called integration flows that all the vendors support. And this provides you some resiliency, scalability, and be able to support multiple different paths in to bring data in the cloud. Compliance is a big issue because you need to ensure that the data is, is being brought in securely and uh, correctly. Reliability is, is always important. Um, every different model has some different uh, weaknesses or opportunity for issues. And so building in reliability into these kind of products and these models that we deploy is very important. And then elasticity. So a retail business where they get the, the spike in sales, let's say it's clothing between Thanksgiving and Christmas, needs to be able to scale up at cost and then scale back down with a reduction in cost. And that's what these type of products um, provide. 
So Gardner did an analysis on these iPass vendors, and that was earlier this year. And you can see uh, Dell and Informatica are really the leaders in this field. We work quite a bit with the Informatica product, um, and we have done work with, with uh, Dell also. But um, these are the type of tools that are evolving and taking in, into account the new capabilities in the cloud. So this is the architecture that um, the Informatica iPass product, in, uh, Informatica Cloud, provides. And you can see it um, is a serverless product that deploys agents and leverages integration between various different sources and different cloud vendors. Uh, you can integrate data into things like Salesforce or um, uh, Facebook, things of that nature for marketing purposes. And we're seeing a, a tremendous growth in this area to integrate on-prem stuff into a cloud leveraging and extending the value of your existing infrastructure and existing applications. But I want to caution everyone, the cloud is not a panacea. As, as uh, Steve Dine, our, our president, reminded me when we reviewed this earlier, um, taking into account the planning and the economics and the services and the correct alignment with those up front is really important for being able to get cost optimization on what you're doing on the cloud. And you're looking at a new environment, which is a services-based environment, aligning the right services at the right level to meet your business needs and having some predictability for a cost containment model is very important. Now, in some of these deployments, um, if you're buying infrastructure as a service, you're still responsible for backups and recovery. Uh, you're still responsible for things like antivirus and security. And actually, those things become very critical because it's no longer protected behind a firewall. So building that into your plan and, and your model is very important going forward. In some cases, if you're buying uh, software as a service, like a, a um, Snowflake Cloud, Snowflake Data Warehouse, those are built in. And so you're, you're leveraging the cost and the efficiency of that company for that. But Critical to this is uh, developing knowledge of how your workloads are going to deploy and how they're going to scale and align with what your business needs. So those are things that we take into account um, and part of a, a well-formed plan to being successful and efficient in the cloud. And then the other thing we want to emphasize is the traditional data practices are still important. In fact, they become more important because you're now paying as you go. And so things like data governance, data quality, data integration. Those are things that are vital to being successful in the cloud and, and moving forward and having this work in an efficient manner for you. The key to maximizing this is making sure we're doing right in those areas in alignment with the right cloud resources and the right practices being deployed. This is, we come back to that Gartner um, statement earlier about only 20% going toward business transformation and business enhancement. And getting these elements right aligned with the correct cloud model and, and the correct resources and purchasing in the cloud is very important to get into that 80% of your spend being for business value. So what are the benefits of, of a well-architected cloud plan? Well, you know, we can cut costs in some cases by up to 50% by able being able to plan and purchase correctly, um, aligning those those cloud capabilities and services correctly so we're not spending money unwisely and we're completely aligned with whatever regulatory or security requirements are there. Uh, supportability and high availability needs to be planned into this. And then really understanding um, the seasonality and the scale and growth of what your business is looking at. You may be in a business that is in the um, process of purchasing another company and that's a great opportunity to move things to the cloud and integrate quickly using the mo more modern tools and capabilities. So this is what our customers have uh, helped us define and what our customers are, are being successful with is a three-step process. So an analysis and assessment, understanding where you're at, where your current problems are, understanding your workloads and the type of data you've got, um, defining the economics and seeing what licensing you've got, what will be migrated along, what will expire, um, and then tying all those together in a well-formed uh, assessment result. Putting together a, a develop, 
development and deployment plan if you're migrating to new services or migrating licensing up there. Um, coming up with your deployment plan, how you're going to um, deploy, integrate, scale, and protect, and then a, a detailed project plan so you can train your people and put together the, the roadmap to do it correctly. And then finally, execution of that cloud deployment. And this can this is um, vital for all three of the models, whether it's uh, private cloud, public cloud, or hybrid cloud. So aligning with that, we've put together three offerings of uh, how we how we do this, and these are the details on those, whether they're fixed price or time and material, and the type of work that we do uh, to provide value to our customers. So now it's a good time for questions and answers. Great. Thanks, Eric. Thank you so much. It was very informative. And you know, a couple of things that, that stood out for me um, was I was in particular surprised at how quick some of the deployments that you mentioned you used. You had mentioned one was 30 days and then another one was 90 days. So I, that was a surprise to me because I, I anticipated it being much longer. Um, and I also really like the example, the sports and entertainment example, where you were able to apply the reporting in the cloud to the Apple Watch. Those are some pretty cool um, you know, use cases that I think could apply to well beyond the sports and entertainment industry. So those were some of the standouts for me. Um, for our listeners, um, if you do have questions, please feel free to use the question box inside uh, the webinar. Um, I do have a few that have come up already, so I'll go ahead and queue those up, but um, feel free to type in your questions. Uh, so, Eric, when you were going through the presentation, one of the pages that, that really jumped out, I think for me as well as many of the other viewers, was the choice, all the choices as far as services. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you even get started knowing what services you should select? Great question. There, there's hundreds of services out there and more evolving all the time. New capabilities come into play. The vendors are announcing new products literally on a weekly basis. And so, that's where uh, taking into account the understanding of what your business needs are and the workloads and then bringing in some knowledge to help you jumpstart that effort can, can pay dividends quite a bit. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of experience in, in doing this correctly and working directly with the vendors. So we have deep understanding of what products work, how they align, how they integrate, and how to successfully deploy those. Okay, great, thank you. Is there any you know use case or scenario where the workload might, might not be appropriate or have the, um, have the capability to move to the cloud? Sure. It, it, there, there are cases like that. They're, they're becoming more and more the corner cases where there's less uh, need for that. Some cases, there's security requirements around that that we need to accommodate for. There is a government cloud for government customers that has additional security. But in some cases, the workload may be on an existing platform that's already paid for, and the hardware is there's very little cost, or it may be completely in-house developed. So there's uh, low operating cost. But generally, those at some point will run out of capacity or capability, or as the hardware ages, the costs begin to increase. So we're seeing very, very few workloads that can't be moved to the cloud. That aren't appropriate. Okay. And you know, you you had mentioned security just now, and you know, for years that's that's been the the challenge, right? People have said, I don't I don't feel comfortable moving to the cloud, but I think that they've made huge strides um, in making. Uh, customers more comfortable with moving their data to the cloud. Can you talk a little bit about some of those security sure. pieces? And that's that's really where the value of the cloud comes into play because the big vendors are investing heavily in security models, training their people, building infrastructure that is secure, scalable, and uh, reliable. And so you're leveraging their expense that they've invested on this because they can span this across all their customers. So the net value comes into play that you can use their best practices at their scale of cost. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That's super informative. Okay. Uh, we do have a couple more questions that have come in, so I want to make sure that uh, we get these answered. Um, so the first one uh, uh, that has come in is, how far are the cloud provider in, providers in terms of complying the hardware and the security practices as per the regulation in healthcare? 
So both of the big vendors and most of the products that are on there are all HIPAA compliant. Uh -huh. And this, is, this question in particular, I think, is related to patient data. Right. And patient data, HIPAA compliance um, is all built into the, into the model, into the infrastructure, into the practices that are there. You've got to take into account those regulations into your design and your implementation and your security. But the underlying infrastructure and products are HIPAA compliant. Okay. Great. Good, good. Okay. And, you know, you had mentioned um, earlier, too, that the cloud is, is such a great uh, environment to do bake-offs, proof of concepts, data migrations. Um, how quickly can something like that get spun up and then also broken back down? Great question. In fact, we've got a consultant here that's in the process of training for a deployment um, at a customer, and we were able to spin up an entire data warehouse on Snowflake in six hours for her. That's so nice. yeah. compare that to a traditional environment where we have to provision hardware, provision storage, set mm -hmm. up the networking, the security, users, mm -hmm. uh, which can take days or weeks. In this case, it took six hours to give her about a 100 gigabyte data warehouse fully populated. Great. Okay. Fantastic. I love that example. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Okay. And uh, next question. Uh, what is a good example of when moving to the cloud is not a good idea? Well, a, a good example would be if you've got some highly customized legacy code that um, will not run on a, a modern environment. You're limited to an older operating system. Keep in mind, moving to the cloud means that you're, in most cases, the vendor is managing operating system upgrades, things of that nature. So, for instance, if you're supporting a very old version of Java in an application, uh, you would either need to provision that in the cloud and manage it yourself or stay on-prem. Mm -hmm. Because if you move into a platform as a service, that version of Java will be replaced as the systems get upgraded. Mm -hmm. So that's a good example of where it doesn't apply mm -hmm. to move to the cloud. The other example is if it's uh, code that is no longer supportable, maybe the vendor's gone out of business, uh, it can be very difficult to deploy it in a new environment and support that going forward. Great. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. Um, you know, what I'd like to do now, um, we're coming up on 11.50 here, Mountain Standard Time, and I uh, want to leave some time for people to get to their next meeting. Um, but I do want to mention that this recording will be available online at datasourceconsulting.com. So I do want to mention that. So uh, a couple of questions have come in around, can I get access to the slides and whatnot? You can get access to the recording. So, um, and feel free to you know, share that out to your colleagues or, or whoever else might be interested that wasn't able to attend. Um, also, um, I do want to mention that uh, coming up on October 12th, uh, if you're interested in this um, next topic for educational webinar series, it's going to be GDPR and data governance for seamless compliance. Um, as we know, this is a, a European um, guideline that's uh, trickling down into other areas and becoming a, a hot topic here in the United States and well beyond. So uh, GDPR will be tackled on October 12th if someone's interested in that. So with that, I want to thank Eric, our speaker. Thank you so much for thank this. You. It was super informative. I know I took a lot of notes. So um, if any of our viewers have uh, questions in particular, um, you'll see Eric and information there listed below, as well as my information if you'd like to reach out to me. And we look forward to uh, having you attend our future events. Thank you so much. Thank you.